Hey everyone. In this video, I want to walk through how we can think about learning Azure in 2021. It's one of the most common questions people kind of ask is, well, how can I get started? So my goal for this video is to really walk through how I would approach, I think, today, uh, trying to immerse myself in Azure. Um, if this is useful, please go ahead and give this video a, a like, subscribe, comment, and share. Now, there are many aspects to Azure. I think what's really important is everyone should have a grounding in kind of the core identity constructs, the governance constructs, core infrastructure, things like virtual network, storage, compute. And then I think maybe you can go down different paths based on what your interest or what your job requirement is. This could be applications, it could be administration, it could be DevOps, it could be data, it could be AI. Um, once again, it would be good to have kind of a broad understanding of all those things, but we can certainly go deep into those particular areas. Now, I think the first thing we have to get to actually start learning Azure is access to Azure. Uh, some people may be able to learn by just reading a book or watching something. But I think that the best way is to just immerse and start using the thing. And the nice thing about the cloud is it's very forgiving. I can create something and delete it, create something, delete it. Now, if you don't have access to Azure today, you can go and get a free account. Now, what you can do is I'll actually go to this page. Now, what the free account actually gives us is, is three different things. So we'll actually jump over and have a look. So what we get is, yes, obviously you get this free account. And firstly, you get this $200 of credit that you can spend in the first 30 days. That's really on anything you want within that subscription you're going to create, be it data services, compute, network, whatever you want. Then there's a whole bunch of other services that you get free for 12 months. And if we scroll down, we can kind of see what I'm getting for 12 months. So it's a Linux virtual machine, a B1S, which is burstable, 750 hours, and these are per month, you get these things. A Windows VM, another burstable, 750 hours per month. And then we get some managed disks, some blob storage, file storage. And realize Azure is consumption-based. So when we're seeing here 750 hours, yes, that's kind of like a VM for a month, but I don't have to run one VM for the month. I could run three VMs for eight hours a day. So realize it's all consumption based. And that's kind of a key thing I'm gonna talk about, but optimize how we use those things. So absolutely, yes, I could have a Windows and a Linux burstable VM running all month, or I could be more efficient with it and maybe run three or six for eight or four hours a day and really get actually more advanced environments based on what I'm trying to do. So there's a whole bunch of this credit for the first month, then these things for 12 months. Then there are things that are basically always free. For example, Azure Cosmos DB gives you 400 RUs of provision throughput for free. You pick a certain Cosmos account and say, hey, I want this one to take this 400 RUs. If you actually jump over quickly to the portal, and if I just quickly go to Azure Cosmos DB and click Add, what we actually see on the Add screen is on one of them, you can see I can apply this free tier discount. So I can only have one Cosmos DB account per subscription, but I can say, hey, yeah, I want this one to get those free 400 RUs. Then there were things like, hey, functions and app services. Azure Kubernetes, the orchestration is always free. I pay for the worker nodes. And there are many others. So basically take some time and go through. But hey, I get this $200 of bucket I can use for the first month for really anything. Then I get those things for 12 months and then things that are always free. Now additionally, I can think about, well, if I have something like Visual Studio, and there's, there's different sort of levels of that, I get a certain amount of Azure credit I can activate that really ranges between $50 and $150. So once again, here, if we go and look, make sure you activate this. If you have rights to this, then use it. 
So here we can kind of see, hey, for Visual Studio Enterprise, I get $150. For the MSDM platforms, I get $100. For the kind of standard Visual Studio Professional and Visual, Visual Studio Test Professional, uh, we get $50. So I have these different things I can use um, as a sandbox. And that's kind of a super important thing for really all of these. These are not for production workloads. Think of these as sandboxes I can use to learn and play around with the technologies, both for the free account and these Azure credits. And make sure you don't kind of move production workloads or production data or expose production things in these. Um, your company would have its own governance and controls. Don't put anything company in these things. This is a sandbox for your own little personal learning opportunities. Now, if you, you, you've already used the free accounts, you can't do another one. You do need an email address uh, and a credit card. It doesn't bill you anything. It doesn't start charging you. It's to just stop you creating free account after free account after free account. So that credit card and email is something to kind of uniquely identify you. If you've used all those things up, I mean, maybe just at work. Um, you can get a subscription or a shared sandbox with other people to try out and learn the various things. Now, Azure is consumption-based. Uh, we pay per second for many compute services. We pay for the provision storage or the storage we're using. It, it depends on the type of workload. So don't waste money. When I'm going to start, for example, a new lab, I'm, I'm trying out this new technology. My recommendation is to put everything in a resource group. So in Azure, uh, everything goes in one and only one resource group. And I normally group things together by project. If I put everything into a single resource group for this particular lab I'm doing, it helps me track it. But then when I'm finished with that lab, I can just delete the resource group. I'm not going to risk leaving a disk behind or a public IP that I'm paying for, some data service. I can just, hey, I've done this lab, I've done this exercise, I'll delete that resource group. So keep things tidy, a resource group per kind of lab, so you can delete it so you don't leave things behind. Um, often the compute and the storage are actually separate. If you think about most resources, the state is the storage. The compute, I don't really care about. I could delete the compute, create some new compute, and just reattach it to the storage, which is the state I care about. So what that means is with virtual machines, for example, I can deprovision them from the fabric and stop paying for them. I'd keep the disk, that's the state, then I can just restart the virtual machine. Now you have to be super careful. When I'm dealing with virtual machines and I talk about shutting them down, make sure you're shutting them down from an Azure perspective. I don't wanna just shut them down from within the guest operating system. If I shut them down from within the guest operating system, be it Linux, Windows or Linux, for example, that I've done in this one, you can see it says stopped, which you might think is good, but it's not. It means it's still provisioned on a particular host in Azure, and I'm still paying for it. I want to see stopped deallocated. So make sure when you're not using a virtual machine, I actually go into that virtual machine and I say stop. I'm actually going to stop it at the Azure Fabric level, which means I stop paying for it. There's features I can use, such as auto shutdown. I can say, hey, I know I never work past 5 p.m. on this lab. Hey, auto shut it down for me every night at 5 p.m. Even things like Azure Kubernetes services now, I have worker nodes. You can now basically pause a Kubernetes cluster. And what that will essentially do is deallocate all the nodes in the worker node pools. You can see here for this AKS cluster, I've got a node count of zero. I've essentially stopped the AKS cluster. You never pay for the orchestration and management anyway, you pay for the worker nodes. So for Kubernetes, I can actually now essentially stop the cluster, stop paying for it. And that's kind of a key point. Things like SQL serverless can be paused. Um, the Azure Managed Database, the flexible offerings, um, they can be paused. Many things have automations to shut down. So really think about optimizing your costs. So pause the compute element when you can to save money. 
And the reason I'm really stressing this and the reason it's okay to be cheap is you wanna maintain as much Azure credit and use as you can so I can use the resources in an optimal way to help with my learning. So I always think about, uh, let Mr. Krabs uh, be your role model. My wife got me this Mr. Krabs pin uh, for Christmas because I always complain about me money uh, when anyone spends anything. But be cheap. Um, use just locally redundant storage. Use the standard HDDD disks. If I'm just learning, I don't need the performance. Um, go for those B-series virtual machines that are burstable. Unless you're doing some kind of performance testing, uh, if it's just test dev and I'm learning things, if it's a little bit slower, I probably don't care. Let's get the most kind of bang for the buck. So pick the cheapest SKU that gets the job done to optimize the spend so I can keep playing and learning. You can track. So I can use the Azure cost analysis. If you go into your subscription and cost analysis, it will show you a chart and it will show you how much you're spending, what your trending spend is, and I can even see where I'm spending it. You could even maybe create a budget to just alert you at 80%, say, hey, I'm spending too much money. Remember, in Azure, it is consumption-based. Don't feel guilty about creating a resource, you're learning something, you run it for 10 minutes and then delete it. There's nothing wrong with that. One way you could think about optimizing your spend is create an ARM template. This is the ideal that just creates your environment when you want to do some testing and then delete it. Or if you're not comfortable with ARM templates yet, it could be a PowerShell script or a CLI script. Um, Portal's going to get tough. It's going to be very time consuming recreating everything, but you could. But nothing wrong with creating something, using it for 10 minutes and delete it. Again, we want to be cheap, optimize the resource so we can learn as much as possible. So when I think about where to begin, uh, get a subscription and look around the portal. The portal, while we wouldn't use it to provision services in production, we'd use ARM templates or Terraform because we want it to be a declarative, item potent. It's very intuitive. So it's a good way to actually learn what's there, what the options are. And if you actually hover over services, it will show me some information. So if we go back and look at the portal, and if we actually just go on this far left, you can see over here, all services. And I could do the same thing on the favorites I've pinned. But if I go to all services, we have all the different categories of service. And you can see straight away, hey, look, links to free training, um, links to quick start centers. But if I go to compute, for example, I can see all the compute offerings. If I just put my mouse over it, it brings up this little quick card. And if I leave it there, or just hovered over view, which shows me my resources, shows me appropriate links to free training, shows me useful links to documentation, and even, hey look, there were free offerings that we talked about already for these types of workload. If I go to virtual machine scale sets, get a little hover card, unselect that, go to hover over view, I'm not clicking anything, well, that doesn't really have a lot of good stuff, Go to something else. There we go. Oh, free training, useful links, etc. And again, I could just jump over to one of these links, and that's going to the documentation about the overview. There were quick starts for this technology on the left-hand navigation. There were samples, concepts, how-to guides, reference material, resources. I can download any of these things as a PDF file, so I can maybe take it offline and read it somewhere else. So fantastic resources just available to you for free. So start with the Microsoft Docs. And if you look at the kind of the, the links in the description, I link to all of these, but the main Azure Docs page is a great starting point. And if we look here, we can see, hey, yeah, look, um, I can see kind of featured Azure products. It goes through the various services, languages, different information about the cloud. I can select on any one of these and then it would take me into nice, quick kind of, hey, what are the most important things I probably care about? But then full documentation I can go to to find out about any of these particular areas. Additionally, the documentation um, in the portal links to training. Well, I can also go straight to the Microsoft Learn site. So the Microsoft Learn site has tracks. 
and they're constantly updating these. And these are super useful to actually go through it. So it gives you education about it. And then it actually will have maybe some exercises to actually go and do the things. So you can actually think about, well, I can go and sign in. And in the future, certifications will actually be using this to keep your certs up to date and there'll be a little kind of assessment. But you could kind of customize your path, tell it what you care about. It's showing me popular learning paths. And again, these are all free. There are little assessments along the way to track how you're doing, but everyone learns differently. Um, I don't think there's a, a right or wrong. So go and look at what all the options are, but I would definitely look at the documentation, look at those free modules, get the free subscription. Don't get the free subscription until you're ready to start learning, because remember that $200 starts from when I create that thing. Um, but you can get a lot done, and then that 12 months and the always free services. Um, now, obviously, I, I create these videos. I create a lot of video-based learning, so do many other people. Um, I've got my YouTube channel, there's no adverts, there's no video banners, there's no anything on it. It's just about helping learn. So I have kind of a two hour infrastructure overview that I just posted for 2021 and update it each year. So that kind of goes over the whole gambit of the different things you, you might kind of want to know about. Uh, you can kind of see I actually just uh, posted that um, just almost now while I'm recording this video. So that's my, it's two hours long, so there's a lot of content there. Um, but that would give you kind of a good overview. I have a 20 hour, 12 part Azure Masterclass. Now that really goes through really kind of everything from infrastructure to applications, from database. So I go through, and again, that's all on the channel. There's a playlist, there's a GitHub site with all the sample code links to all the other videos. I have deep dives, uh, multi-hour things on AKS, express route, overviews, certification specific like study guides for the fundamentals exams and more. And I, I do a weekly update just to help people stay up to date. And, and many other people do fantastic content as well. So you can go and check kind of, if, if you learn better by sort of those videos, I do a lot of whiteboarding, pick what works for you. Many people do great blogs. Um, there's paid training courses, both live and online. I do a lot of stuff on Pluralsight, but again, there are many other options with fantastic trainers out there. Um, I mean, there's books. I mean, I myself, I mean, I've written a lot of books. Um, and the challenge with books is, I'm talking about my own as well here, it takes you time to write the book, so things change, and then it takes time to publish the book. So they're probably at least six months out of date by the time it hits the shelves. But some of the key constructs might still be valid. So things about architecture would still be very useful, but just realize the actual specifics of the technology uh, may have evolved. But don't pick one. Uh, everyone learns differently. Uh, pick what works for you. Try different things. So what about certifications? Everyone says, well, how should I start with certifications? Uh, they may help. Um, jobs may want to see certifications. They may help you with a path. So definitely, I mean, if you're brand new, start with the fundamentals. There's fundamentals around Azure, around data, around AI, around Microsoft or 365, um, Power BI. Start with the fundamentals. And then there are kind of associates, so they're a bit more complicated about a particular role, speciality or technology. And there are expert certs like the architect or the DevOps. So if you go to the Microsoft site, once again, it gives you full details about all of the different certifications available to you. So let's take a look at this. And the fantastic thing here is so you can go and look and you can see all the different ones. So I can say, oh, look, it's Azure Fundamentals. For each of these, it actually says, well, what's the exam? So I can look at the exam and then it actually shows me, well, what are the skills? So I can download a detailed list of the skills I need. And then it links to free training for that. And this is really for all of the different exams. There's these free learning paths for all of them. And if you're wondering about, well, what's the path, there's actually a certification poster. And here on the left, we see the Azure. So we think about what well, we can have the Azure fundamentals, the AI fundamentals, the Azure data fundamentals. Then we can move on to maybe there's certain specialities around SAP and IoT. Then we see all the different associate certifications like admin and developer and data engineer, etc. 
And then finally you get the experts. So the expert certifications here for DevOps and architect. So depending on your interest, depending on what you, you really want to do, um, yeah, the certifications, those paths might lead you, but at minimum, they can help lead you to those free kind of learning paths to help you really get started on those things. And one of the things I would really say is don't, don't stress over these things. Um, people always stress about taking a cert. Um, what if I fail? What if you fail? What? Um, you helped, it would tell you where you're weaker. And you'll just redouble your efforts, you'll focus on that weak point, you'll pass it the next time. Don't overstress on them. And I've got videos in my cert playlist about preparing, but this is really not a big deal. Don't overthink it. Prepare. Um, do the best you can, but don't stress about failing. Everyone fails things sometimes. I always say the only true failure is to give up. You just, hey, where did I not maybe do so well? And go and take it again. So we learn Azure. Make sure you stay current. Uh, Azure changes very frequently. So there are a number of places you can go to stay up to date. So Azure has an Azure update site. Um, if I actually go over to this, it's also like an RSS feed, but it will go through and show you, hey, here's what's changed. You can go and then click on these and it will give you some details about what exactly this means. There's also an Azure blog, which I'll, again, I've got the links to all of these in the description. So that can be useful to kind of go ahead and stay up to date on. And then there, there are other sources, like there's an Azure AD blog, there's a governance blog, so you can go and stay up to date through those things. Um, I actually create a weekly Azure infrastructure update to try and save people having to track all those things. <laughs> so what I do uh, on my site is every Sunday I release kind of this infrastructure update and there's actually a playlist. You can see all the kind of historical ones um, somewhere at Azure infrastructure updates. Everyone, everyone, welcome and to this week's Azure. Basically, I go through all of those things and then I'll whiteboard out what exactly that change means. Um, I might show the technology if that's appropriate, um, but it just saves you. It's between 10 and 20 minutes. It depends on how many updates there were, obviously. But again, if you go and subscribe, um, I post that every Sunday. So uh, in terms of getting started, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong approach. Everyone learns differently. Use what works for you. I definitely think um, you need access. So use the free account. Uh, maybe if you have those Visual Studio MST and credits, use that. Maybe through work, you can get a subscription. You need to be able to get hands on. But remember, there are those kind of 30 days of credit, and there's the 12 months, there's the always free. So we can do a lot without spending any money. Make sure you don't put things in the cloud you shouldn't be putting in the cloud. Um, if you're learning, make up your own little project don't use customer data don't use your company's data don't use company's code it's your sandbox don't link it in any way to your company don't want to do that and i would just say good luck um, again it's very forgiving just make sure you're tidy delete things stop things optimize your spend keep track of it and you can really stretch those free and 12 months and 200 dollars credit a really long way uh, to help you in your learning uh, but with that um, any questions, um, I, I keep an eye on the comments. Uh, please just comment below. But uh, take care and good luck in all your learning.